So, hello everybody. Now it is a couple of minutes past six, so let's begin tonight's uh, webinar lecture conversation. We're going to call it a conversation. It's quite informal tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, my name is Jessica Metheringham, the chair of Unlock Democracy, um, which I do at council meetings three times a year, plus the AGM. You may have seen me from that. Um, but I am joined tonight. Uh, well, you can see I'm joined by Ian, Ian Dunt, who many of you may know uh, most from politics.co.uk. That's certainly what I think about when I think of Ian. But some of you may have been listening to his podcasts. You had a Romaniacs. Is that the uh, the name of the main one? Uh, plus you had the bunker. Yeah, it used to be called that. Yeah. <laughs> used to be called that it's changed now you can tell that i am not a podcast listener videos and podcasts i'm like no you know my um my brain is not really attached to my ears <laughs> it needs to go in through the eyes um but you also have several books so i'm going to wave this prop around this is the most recent book um let's do a bit of shameless plug there for you ian uh but welcome uh welcome tonight we're going to have a bit of a conversation uh welcome to everybody else as well um do put some questions for Ian. Uh, rather than using the chat, there should be a question and answer function. So if you click on that and put questions in there, that would really help us to sort out what's where. Um, later, I will be browsing through those, trying to merge them into questions. So you may not see your exact words come up, but I will be trying to uh, braid the strands together to create a question to present to Ian. But from now, welcome Ian. Lovely to see you. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's start off by, I mean, just, just a very quick question. You used to work for Unlock Democracy many years ago. What was that like? How was it? <laughs> It was fun. I mean, I was I was basically an intern, so I, there was not a lot of sort of, you know, executive power put in my lap at the time. Um, and I spent a lot of it doing some, I mean, tremendously tedious sort of data entry stuff on, I think, don party donations. But, and then also some more interesting, I remember looking at a, I think it, this, to show you how old I am and how long ago this was, it was, I think, to summarise, was it? Jack Straw's proposals for House of Lords reform. So we're, we're going a while back, basically, which were actually quite good proposals, by the way, and which I approved of at the time. But generally, what I do remember was sort of being in an office. I'm not just saying this. It was a very nice office to be in, full of really quite bright, idealistic, critical people who were very informal with each other and whose main method of, of dialogue was basically to take the piss out of each other, which is kind of the only social technique that I fully understand for a working environment or a social one. And it was, those were, that was a nice period for me. So yeah, so it's nice to be back on Zoom. Excellent. Well, welcome. My first job, my first proper paid job was working for a member of parliament. So <laughs> your latest book feels very familiar. Um, so I used to work for Alistair Burt. I worked for him for two years and it was a a uh, really nice job to have. I then joined the civil service, as it turns out. Um, but, you know, it, so a lot of the things that you're talking about in your latest book about you know, how Westminster doesn't work feel terribly familiar. And one of the things I wanted to sort of you know, pull out of there was what MPs actually do, because, of course, there are several different models of MPs. You are talking about, you know, you're talking about how some of them are becoming more orientated towards towards leadership. You know, you cite a study, uh, James Vernbode's study of MPs, and you know, the finding that more are more are going towards more leadership positions. Do you think this is a problem? Do you think they should be more constituency focused? Uh, I mean, in, in that study, it's, it's more really about the incentives on this sort of relatively complicated psychological sort of model. Mm. And usually you'd find in the general population, you know, people have all, all sorts of different values. So they might value security or they might value hedonism, um, et cetera, et cetera. You have different things you're aiming for. And politicians, when they applied this to them, it's very hard to get politicians to talk about what motivates them. I mean, it didn't used to be. Like, you know, in the 1970s, you'd get these studies with, you know, bar, huge swathes of, of MPs answering, including very, very senior uh, sort of ministers. 
now you sort of if you're lucky you'll get sort of 30 percent of them they're, they're really low to talk about this stuff and what it showed when he did his study was that they are overwhelmingly motivated by wanting to make the world a better place so all of the stuff that you hear down the pub if they're all in it for themselves it's, it's all nonsense of course what one person thinks when they think i want to make the world a better place is not necessarily what i think that that would make the world a better place but their motives are pure in that respect however they were much more likely than the general population to value being in control of resources and to be uh, thought of as someone that's having a very high social status when it comes to work. And that's quite telling. I think it's kind of unsurprising in a way, the kind of person who would go through the trials and tribulations of being an MP to get there. But it also gives you an indication of why the pressure of the whip system to behave and to do what you're told and not to look too closely at the legislation that you're being asked to vote on might be very effective on that kind of personality. And the truth is, once they get to the Commons, most of them realise that they have almost no role at all in scrutinising the government or scrutinising legislation. Uh, and that if they were to try and genuinely do that using their independent judgment in an Edmund Burke kind of way, they would very quickly be debilitating. It would be debilitating to their own career. So what they start doing is going into constituency work. Now, there is a huge amount of constituency work to do. The more that the policy uh, fails in this country when it comes to asylum, immigration, uh, welfare, uh, planning, you suddenly get all the, all the sort of broken cases as a result of the policy wash up on MPs' shores. But I think also ultimately, like, the truth is, I think many of them would just prefer to spend their day that way. You're going to spend the day in the Commons making no difference to a piece of legislation, or you can at least fix one problem for one person in the constituency. And that is probably a more fulfilling way to spend your time. And so I think that emotional element is also part of why they're, they're remorselessly dragged to focus more on the constituency work, the kind of social work aspect of it, rather than the legislative screen. Yes. Yes, there's a lot that you can actually do as a constituency MP. You know, you come, you know, it's a much smaller pool where you are a much bigger fish. You know, and your word has a far greater effect there, you know, so I can completely see that. That, that, however, uh, pulls on, a, you know, some of the other questions and I see some coming up here. And there's one that somebody asked about how Westminster communicates with the devolved administrations. So I'd like to ask that one, but also expand it out to local government as well, because sometimes it feels as though constituency MPs are doing local government's work. Sometimes it feels like you know, like Westminster is not communicating with the Welsh Parliament, the Scottish Parliament, you know, basically there's a whole mess there. Now, I'm I aware think, I haven't exactly. really asked a proper question, so if you could make something out of that non question <laughs> that would be lovely. Yeah, no, I think that's actually quite easy. There's quite a lot to work with there. They're very bad at communicating with devolved governments. I mean, on the on that element of where does the constituency work end and a local councillor's work begin, the truth is that most of the stuff that MPs get given for their constituency work is stuff that should have gone to the local council. It should be being dealt with by, by the council. Um, technically, the only thing that an MP should be doing in the constituency work is something that was came under the purview, the, the, the um, judgment of a minister. So it shouldn't really be an intractable planning dispute, for instance. And yet that is exactly the kind of thing that they spend an awful lot of time doing. And even then, I'm talking about, like, that's the more kind of respectable end of things. Like the kind of examples that MPs were giving me when I was when I was interviewing for the book were just extraordinary. There was like one person that went because the toilet seat that they bought from the shop was the wrong size. Another that went because they were in a just long discussion with Sky about an aerial that had or had not been put up. And the thing is, the, the kind of mortifying thing is that very often they do it the MP takes on the case. It's absurd to even call it a case. They take it on because they are terrified of that person going onto Facebook and saying, my MP's a bastard, he won't help at all. And they're even more terrified of the local newspaper. You know, yes. if, if there are any local newspapers that happen to study. My exist. MP won't help me in my dispute with home base about this toilet seat. I mean, that seems <laughs> ridiculous, but, you know, but I can see why they're doing it. I mean, certainly the MP, we... Um, we shared offices with used to get remote controls in the post you know there's something wrong with my tv it's just... <laughs> that is quite extraordinary so i mean they they look part one that 
infantilizes and discredits what it is that an MP is supposed to be. And any system where there's something is not good. But part two, the more sympathetic um, version, I guess, is we underestimate at almost every level of the political system just how much work people are being given and how knackered they are. Like that was the first person to say that to me for the book was Nick Clegg. I remember at the end of an interview, sort of saying like, "What's the one thing I'm not asking you that I should be talking about?" And he was just like, "You just don't know how tired we all are, <laughs> like, or how we were." He was like, "You're knackered, you know, especially at a ministerial level. You know, you're getting by on sort of like four or five hours sleep, and you have to look in control. You have to look composed. With MPs, they've got that constituency work. They've got anything else they happen to be given, perhaps by the whips, whether it's sitting in a delegated legislation committee or sitting on a select committee or an APPG. Then they're going off to the constituency. They're doing that work, and there's the emotional impact, which I think is also underanalyzed and underdiscussed, of the fact that you're living most of your life away from your family. You're basically away from your family during the working week. So that kind of real separation, I know there are some people in the world who think that sounds like a beautiful way of existing, but for most people that sucks, right? That's actually quite difficult. And eventually it starts to, I think, impact on their competence, their ability to handle large um, cognitive loads, their ability to be able to scrutinize the legislation in the first place because they're overworked, overstressed, overtired, and were anyway in the first place lacking many of the qualities that would be needed to look at it in a detailed way. Yeah, no, I can see that, which uh, drags us very nicely to one of the questions uh, Robin has asked about the self-selection process, which, to be honest, has always been something where I'm thinking, who would say I want to be an MP? Now, you also say in your book about, um, you know, the fact that people are selected by a very small number, you know, the uh, the party selection process, you know, that that is a tiny number of people purest of the pure I think you were talking about at that point you know the people who are still members whereas of course you know a couple of generations ago these would be large parties making selections but even more than that what about the self-selection process you know who stands up and says well actually this is what I want to do what's funny about that right is we know that we can influence that second part like mm. when you so to take the Lib, Lib Dems when they were like, well, we need to we know that we have a problem here with how many women are coming in to be MPs. And we know we have a problem with how many ethnic minorities are coming in to be MPs. It's just not enough. And most of the action that was taken was about conversations, really, mm. about finding people, in local constituencies that come to a meeting and just, you know, having a chat to them, directing resources towards them. But the beginning of that is saying this is a thing that you can do. You know what I mean? That, that is a problem that actually can be fixed. The self-selection aspect, I think, can be fixed to a very large degree by just imbuing people with the confidence and making it feel like a believable goal for them to achieve. Whether they feel that it was a very you know, good goal to have after five years of being an MP is another matter. But it can, you can work towards it in that way. That My real problem is with selection, which I just think is, is an absolute shit show. Because you, I mean, to, to give you an impression of how low these numbers are, you know, we look, if you look at Tim Bale's book on how many uh, party members, the parties themselves, you know, the National Trust has five times more members than all of Britain's political parties combined. So you're anyway dealing with tiny numbers, probably about a million people over the, over the whole country, a political party. Then you've got the people who actually attend constituency meetings and are actually active party members. Then before they even get a chance to vote on who the candidate will be in, in the local election, I beg your pardon, in the, ele in, in the seat during the general mm -hmm. election, yep. they're going to have them screened by the selection committee, a much smaller group of people sitting in that council, and also by party HQ. Then finally, it will come to the party members. You look at Tim Bale's work, and it's just in very small numbers, like some, you know, sometimes as low as 7%, sometimes a bit more, who vote either for the candidate for the selection candidate or for the party leader in either of those contests. Now we know that the party leader contest is obviously much more visible, it's much more dramatic, people talk about it more, it's on the news, so we would assume that that number is itself very very inflated. When we talk about who is selecting people to run as an MP, you're dealing with a minority of a minority of a minority that are going to be there doing that. It is a really, um, it is a way of encouraging, us. it's a system that essentially encourages hyper-partisanship. It's partisans, the kind of people who stuff leaflets through doors on a rainy weekend, who are going to pick other people who they think will stuff leaflets through doors on a rainy weekend. 
And there are some changes to that, but ultimately that's the push. And the conversation of who would be good at scrutinizing legislation, who would come in with an element of expertise on national insurance on social security These that just questions. doesn't get thought of you know that's that's just so far down the line you know that they're saying actually you know who do i want to you know who do i want to go door knocking with essentially exactly yeah. which is a you know which you know in some ways is a fair measure but it's not really what the job is about nor is it you know what the job should be about now actually yeah. we've very much been talking about members of parliament um, but of course, you know, there's the House of Lords. You start off being quite generous to the House of Lords, which is somebody who has been trying to um, talk about things to do with, say, the policing bill, um, the elections bill, you know, in recent years. And, you know, before that, you know, the lobbying bill, you know, the gagging act, you know, then I can completely agree with this. You know, actually, maybe the Lords are doing a better job. Do you think the Lords are doing a better job than the Commons? And do you, uh, I suppose there's the problem that they'd be, you know, that they are constantly in fear of being completely muzzled or being reformed. I mean, <laughs> you know, what are your feelings about the Lords? You know, the other half of our Westminster uh, House. I mean, I'm a big fan of the House of Lords. I think that if you were to imagine our system without the Lords, it would be truly terrifying. Right? There are things that we need to change, and I think they're pretty obvious. I mean, the first thing to change is the Prime Minister needs to lose the power to nominate people to the Lords. You should just take that away from them. They can't be trusted. They could never be trusted, and they certainly can't in the post-Johnson era of just putting Russian assets and party donors into the Lords. It's abysmal. It's a disgrace. So you take that away and you hand it to the House of Lords Appointments Commission. We obviously need to get rid of the hereditary peers. No one pushes more for them to get rid of the hereditary peers than the House of Lords. Like almost every year, the House of Lords pushes, like, please get rid of these embarrassing fruit loops. Mm -hmm. Nobody does it. And of course, the bishops as well, because just as a sort of self-respecting advanced nation, you really shouldn't have them anywhere near a legislature. So once that's all there, Despite Russian the fact point. that they say some of the most sensible things, I mean, you know, this is the thing that I feel are real, you know, different pulls here. You know, so, you know, you've got, you know, you've got individuals there who are saying incredibly sensible things and you're sat there going, well, I don't really agree with the fact that you are there, but I'm really glad that you're there because nobody else is saying these sensible things. But I think other people are saying, so, I mean, if I think of something like Justin Welby um, on the illegal migration bill and on refugee policy in general, I agree. It's really good. I very obviously agree with everything that he is saying. However, it can't just be on what people say. It has to be on why did you put them in the chamber? Now, to put someone in there because of religious membership is plainly intolerable. But we don't really need to worry about making sure that the bishops are there for those issues because one of the advantages of the House of Lords, primarily through the crossbench uh, peers, so this is an, an invention really of the Blair period in a meaningful way, just to have non-party politics people have had a lot of experience in science, in the arts, in business, in law, who we'll just come there and actually scrutinize the legislation. Like the one thing that basically never happens in the House of Commons doesn't really happen in Parliament very often. To just sit there and apply deep specialist knowledge, deep subject knowledge to legislation. And then something really interesting happens. It's almost at that stage, like it's the first time the government's even looked at its own bill. You know, you see, you see them come out to play on legal issues, um, on welfare, on security. You just think, like, what? Well, no one's really looked at the bill. No one had to in the Commons because you just used your majority to bludgeon it through. So finally, suddenly, changes are made. It's almost at this stage, I would say, that the Lords has become an unofficial part of the legislation writing program because at that point, changes are made to the bill. Why? No one cares what's going on in the House of Lords. There are no journalists there covering it. No one really gives a damn. So the government feels it can do it without losing any of its face, without losing any machismo, and you start to see changes. So between 2017 and 2019 in that session, we had 2,770 successful amendments in the House of Lords. That's just crazy. right? That's a crazy number. You never see any of this in the Lords. You never see any improvement in the bills, but you do in the Lords. So I get it when people say, as Starmer is saying now, although Starmer seems deeply confused about it, or at least the Labour position is very hard to extrapolate from their statements, that we need reform. And that's sort of fine. But you have to say, the only kind of re reform proposals I'm interested in listening to seriously 
are those which recognize what the Lord is doing right at the moment and show some other way of replicating it, at least somewhere else in the system. There was um, there was a white paper about reforming the Lord in about 2008, I'm going to say. It might have been a little before that, but it basically set out, you know, what sort of law, you know, what sort of Lords, you know, they'd like to have. And there was very much a balance between, you know, how big do we want to have the elected element versus the appointed element? And, you know, that seems to be the thing, you know, people, you know, most people agree on reforming the House of Lords. You know, but it's disagreeing about, you know, what proportion of those. You know, personally, I think that I'd agree with that white paper, which I think came down gently, not strongly, you know, gently on the side of about 75% elected and 25% appointed. Um, what sort of proportion? Um, I mean, is that something where you'd be prepared to say, you know, what sort of proportion you'd be more in favour of? You know, would you want to keep it mainly oh, yeah. appointed or would you want to, you know, have it sort of, you know, half and half elected or? No, no, very, it's very easy for me to say. I don't think there should be anyone there that's elected. It's absolutely fine. Okay. It's a fully appointed chamber. Like, the crucial thing here to me is you know, it, it has very limited powers. It is not proposing legislation. It is not really able to kill legislation. We can talk about the use of the Parliament Act, but all the Parliament Act can do at most is delay something for 13 months. And you can note the way that even now with this government, with the most sort of legally illiterate, morally incontinent bills, like the illegal migration bill, the Lords still won't go there. They still won't kill it. You know, it is a revision chamber. Now, democracy, I'm aware of the group that I'm talking to at the moment. Like, democracy <laughs> is a good thing. We need much more of it in the House of Commons by reform of the electoral system. But it is not the only good thing in the world. Expertise and specialism matters. The ability to have one chamber which proposes, which comes up with ideas, hopefully quite idealistic and radical ones, mm -hmm. and another one which can say, using my real world experience and deep subject knowledge, I think you're going to have problems in these areas. So we revise it, not kill it, mm -hmm. not oppose it, revise it here. That seems to me to be a perfectly acceptable system and one that doesn't really require any democratic input whatsoever. No, I mean, I can I can see that. I think we disagree, you know, but we can say that. Most people, I think, are very much about, you know, right, that's the Lords, you know, revising chamber, you know, how you get people in there is, you know, a different question. But the crucial question then becomes, how do you reform the House of Commons? You know, you know, what sort of, you know, what sort of PR would you be looking for in order to make the House of Commons something which is truly democratic rather than the the hodgepodge that we currently have at the moment? Yeah, I mean, that, so that to me is like where the real democratic deficit is. And I always think that the simplest forms of PR are the best. So just expand the constituencies. You're looking for between, you know, what, let's say three to seven MPs in each constituency. It's all you, it's all you really need. I don't think you need a much more convoluted system than that. We were talking earlier because this is the kind of thing that we do when no one's uh, filming us about boundaries, <laughs> because that's the kind of nerdery that you and I, I talk about boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> I work on boundaries you know, for a while. Favorite. We were both enjoying that conversation much more than anyone would have if they were listening in on it. But like, and so in that case, I mean, I think you know, once you expand constituencies to that size, you get ones that make a lot more geographic sense than the ones that we have now. I mean, our constituencies now are really quite artificial things, but you would be able to say. You know, for instance, in Cornwall, I mean, Cornwall could be one constituency of about six or seven MPs, or it could be two, you know, East and West Cornwall, three MPs. You, could, you would have something that made a lot more sense for the geography and I think identity of this country than we have. And most importantly, you would then actually start counting the fucking votes, which we do not do under our present system. We ignore two thirds of votes, either because they voted for someone who has already won or because they voted for someone who did not win. Like that adds up. I mean, at its worst, it's like a complete disenfranchisement of particularly urban voters. You look at the amount of surplus vote just adding up and like just to the re if you just take the constituencies of Manchester, you can elect another four Labour MPs on the back of just the surplus vote, let alone anything else. It is an absolutely intolerable system. But here's the second part of that for me is it's not just about democracy. It's also about creating a culture of um sort of productive adversariality. What we have in the Commons is like 
is deadened adversariality. I shout at you, you shout at me, neither of us, gives, even is remotely thinking that we're going to improve the legislation, we just condemn, 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 hope someone clips it for Twitter, maybe in your wildest dreams they'll clip it for the evening news, right? That is not helpful. In most European countries where you have PR, you have some kind of committee process during the legislative phase where MPs, because you've got much tighter majorities and because you know you have to work together to get things done, will sit there and go, I know you have the right to pass legislation. I don't particularly agree with what you're doing, but I would be much more comfortable if you did it in this other way than this way. And that, that problem solving, that critique, that constructive opposition is a product in a very large extent of PR. I think you see elements of it in Holyrood. I mean, if you were to take the, you know, the, the bill on, um, on hatred, on incitement of hatred, which is a really dubious bill with all sorts of difficult sort of elements that hadn't been thought through, it was improved once it went through that system. You have comparable bills here, they simply are not. So one of the key arguments for me for, me, for PR is, look, it's primarily always gonna be a democratic one, but the second one is constitutional and it's about how you have actual sensible policy making. PR can help you with that. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, what you're describing, you know, would be the STV solution, you know, rather than the, let's have a two tier parliament, you know, for example, you know, the Scottish Parliament, you know, there are list members, there are constituency members. Now, personally, this is somewhere where um, I'm entirely with you, you know, that I would prefer to see something where you've got a mixed pattern, you know, sort of, you know, somewhere, a, somewhere between the three to seven number. Um, mm. So single transferable vote constituencies. I mean, Personally, I think, and I don't know whether you agree, that part of the reason that we have not moved towards something like that would be that it would make election at night uh, longer, less exciting, <laughs> less worth staying up for. And I think that there's an element of people saying, OK, well, this is what we've always had. We've always had this super simple first past the post system, which means that we have this lovely you know this lovely election night you know finishes at 10 you know we can show Sunderland doing their you know <laughs> racing the ballot boxes down the uh, the paths you know which is great fun to watch in person as well um but it's that kind of yeah you know that it sort of destroys the way that we've always done it and I think that's a large element of it that it's not actually that it would be you know it's not actually that people are committed to first past the post they're committed to the status quo whatever that might be i think the main parties also know that it's kind of it would be the end of the way that they do business because they work essentially as large internal coalitions you know it doesn't really make any sense for there to be a party that has jeremy corbyn and keir starmer in it you know jeremy corbyn and tony blair Whatever. It just doesn't make any real sense. In the same way, it's that a it really, really, make... really big tent. It's a, a very big tent. tent. <laughs> you arguably, that tent is too large and will not have, you know, stability in a storm. And you would say the same for, you know, Lee Anderson and Rory Stewart on the other side. Mm -hmm. So what you get when you, whenever you have PR, and this happens pretty much everywhere, is you see a split in these parties, and you usually end up with about seven parties. You have a far right party, you have a centre right party, you have a couple of centrist parties. You have a social democratic party, you have a communist party, and you have a green party. Like that's how it breaks down. Now, I like it breaking down that way because that reflects the preferences of voters in an advanced industrial society. So it makes sense. That's what it looks like because it's representative now. If you're currently running Labour, for instance, you might not be so keen on that because it's like, oh, well, hang on a minute. You know, this just became a, a bit more complicated for us. So I get it. There's all sorts of reasons why they would be scared of how this thing would play out. But they're not good constitutional or moral reasons. They're self-interested. So the questions that come out of that and, you know, the questions that people are asking, you know, time and time again is firstly, how do we actually do that? You know, because we've been talking about PR for a long time. You know, we've been saying, yes, you know, this is bad. We need change. You know, this model is quite good. This model is good. You know, there are multiple models you can go to. But how do we actually convince the politicians? How do we convince the public of that? Um, the second question is about dark money. So, you know, can we sort of, you know, put that aside and go, let's talk about money in a minute. But, you know, how do we convince people that PR is actually the way we need to go? There's a certain amount of um, disingenuousness to it, I think. Like, if you look at the very impressive campaign for PR inside of Labour, 
which has been like really well thought through, going for constituency after constituency, trying to get it, you know, onto the discussion at party conference. I mean, that, unfortunately, that's not really ever going to make that much of a difference because the leadership always controls in the manifesto. Ultimately, it's a kind of veneer of democracy and Labour. It doesn't really stack up. The arguments that they use, <coughs> I think, are largely false. Um, but it's good that they're making them. It's essentially to say, you know, like. PR is a way of demonstrating the innate centre-left sensibility of most countries in which it operates. It keeps right-wing parties out of power. You tend to have better public services. You tend to have a more uh, stable state because you don't have centre-right parties kind of becoming completely insane as the current one has, destabilising everything. Now, I don't like that argument. I don't like the argument of we're going to change the electoral system to keep the right out of power because the argument is supposed to be it's supposed to reflect democracy, people's preferences. Now, however, if you were to use my arguments, I think inside Labour, they would have much less purchase, certainly with the trade unions. I mean, the reason that that campaign was able to get the trade unions on the side is because it was making a very different argument to the kind of one that I would make. Um, so you tailor the argument. To me, with Starmer, and it doesn't seem like I think we've got we're going to get very far there, but it has to be to try to demonstrate that constitutional and electoral reform are part of making things work. It's not just some kind of nerdy moral issue that we are badly governed because we have a poor constitutional foundation to the manner in which we pass and scrutinize legislation. The poor ideas get through and break down the public services because the country doesn't have enough of a separation of power. It has far too much executive power in one direction. And this just leads to sloppy legislation. Mm -hmm. So making it in those terms, which I think is the way that he likes to see himself, he kind of, he, te to call it technocrat is, sounds negative, but he likes to see himself as someone who's going to get things done, who's going to get things fixed. Mm -hmm. The argument is this is how you do it. Look, there is a period of about two to three years after a party gets into power where you can secure change. You see it in 1979 with the creation of the Select Committees under Margaret Thatcher. You see it with all manner of things, actually, independence of the Bank of England, uh, eventually a kind of reform of the House of Lords might not have gone as far as they wanted, but it was actually still pretty impressive under Labour. The Labor. first lot of different reforms to the House of Lords, some of which may have been slightly farcical. Yes, exactly. And ended, you know, with preposterous votes, you know, late at night and Robin Cook starting to lose any kind of sense of hope about politics in front of your eyes. But had a, a, a better beginning. You see it in 2010 with the creation of the Office of Budget Responsibility. There can be constitutional change in those first years. What you have to do is get the opposition thinking in idealistic terms and in a way that they feel that they can't get out of it by the time that they are in government. It can be done. You've just got to, you know, fight for what you believe in. Yeah. No, and it means, I mean, that, that makes me feel less positive. You know, it makes me feel like we're not quite there on PR, you know, because Labour is in such a mess with itself about, you know, whether it believes in PR or not. And, you know, different, you know, different parts of the party, different elements of the party seem to be pushing for different things. Um, so it makes me feel that we as the various campaigns, you know, saying we really need PR, that we're not quite there. So, I think you're right. audience, um, the, next, the next six months is vital, okay, everyone? We've got to do more. Yeah, there is a fundamental... Uh, sorry, one more bit, because I know we need to move on from this. But you're, you're fundamentally right, I think, because the two main parties, even if they're losing at a particular moment, always ultimately invested in the system that assesses the geographical distribution of a vote. They have set bundles of voters in towns and rural areas that eventually will hand them a victory if they can target them effectively. The parties that lose from it are the ones who are obviously much more open. So I suspect that just as you saw when there were signs of a much closer relationship between Paddy Ashdown and Tony Blair and the build up to 97, right, if that had been a tighter majority, if Blair hadn't had quite so much power at the end of that, I think we would have seen more movement there. I think he was quite open to it. In all likelihood, change will come from some sort of relationship between the Lib Dems and Labour. How that takes place, the forum is unclear, but I think that'll probably be the path to victory. Mm, yeah. Quite a few people have asked about uh, the role of money in politics, you know, and we're thinking here about the campaigns, you know, we're thinking about donors, we're thinking about uh, dark money. I mean, how much of a problem do you think this is and how do we solve it? I mean, I don't think it's too, it's, look, it ain't great. 
But I don't think we have a I don't think we have an absolutely disastrous system when it comes to the to the money in this country. Most of it's sort of fairly above board. The the filth I mean, most of the filth comes with the treatment of donors afterwards, and even and, you know. It's, it's not appetizing, but it doesn't add up to the most profound sort of impact that we face. I mean, having, you know, the, the regular balls where you have sort of suspicious Russians playing tennis with Theresa May or something, you know, it's not great, but it is not the heart of the problems that we look at. The kind of level of money as well is not that severe. I mean, you, I would argue that I'd be more concerned, to be honest, about the amount of money someone needs to have to get selected as an MP just for selection, not for the actual campaign, mm -hmm. that that is a real hindrance to getting, especially marginalized people into the job. So look, it's it's not ideal. It, in my list of things to fix, it doesn't, it doesn't get into the first side of April. Okay, no, that's fair enough. Okay. Um, we've talked, so that thing about people needing money to be selected, you know, that brings us back to what we were talking about before. And I mean, Someone has asked in here, and I think it's a good question, whether you think that the quality of MP has dropped from 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Is that because we're not selecting the right people? You know, is that, you know, going back to where we started the conversation? You know, <laughs> has it really dropped? Do, do they sim simply work in an environment where, you know, where they can't do as much as they would like to? I always feel this, so I have this instinctive feeling of like we're clearly looking at some kind of sustained cognitive degeneration in the political class. And yet, and of course, because what else can you think? I mean, like the other day, Lee Anson comes out and says that his refugee policy is to fuck off back to France. And you get the government come out and say, well, we stand by that comment absolutely. And you just think, well, obviously, we're in decline here. Like we're in intellectual and moral decline. I think it's probably not true. I think it's very, I imagine, and I am assured by sort of older colleagues and friends that every generation feels the same about the MPs that they have. I was reading a book on Churchill a little while ago, and there's exactly the same conversations going on at that point. Probably true. Mm -hmm. If we keep on infantilizing the role of an MP, it can hardly surprise us that they stop living up to their potential, right? Like we don't yeah. give them, there is nothing for them to do in the Commons. You know, you can join an APPG, an all-party parliamentary group. You can join a select committee. That's good. That would be a good way to spend your time. And that's actually where there is some expertise and some genuine sort of investigation into the world around you and into policy. But in the House of Commons, they have a completely redundant role. Most of the time, they have no idea what it is that they're even voting on, let alone an opinion about it. Mm. Sorry, you were going to... That was what I was... Yeah, that was what I wanted to talk about, actually, because you know, there's something in your book about how very few people understand parliamentary procedure, um, mm -hmm. which is fair enough. Parliamentary procedure is difficult. You know, this is not to suggest that I understand it at all. You know, at some point I had a copy of Erskine May, which I flicked into about five times and used as a doorstop. <laughs> you know, <laughs> huge book. Uh, you know, very useful. Very useful for balancing things on, actually. Um, but it's the sort of thing where, you know, you you then get governments who seem determined to rip up parts of our um, semi-existing constitution, you know, our non-written down constitution, and they want to change the way that things are done. I mean, surely there is a link between people not knowing very much about how parliamentary procedure works with um, the things we saw with the policing bill, for example, where they are giving a huge amount of discretionary powers to ministers to decide things later, to change their mind later. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to, to basically the rise of statutory instruments and the sort of idea that we can just sidestep parliament completely. I mean, and you know, it feels like a logical endpoint of a process that already started with sidelining MPs. The, the, the ignorance of procedure, and even using the word procedure doesn't help us because it makes it sound so sort of bought, like just, just really complex and grey, is, is twofold, I think. Firstly, it's in the country. You know, I mean, you know, for, for all the problems that America has, you still get kids taught at a pretty young age how laws are passed. Now, we really have very little of that in schools. I would actually say that if you would have if you were to ask someone who reads the newspaper every day, so a highly, you know, engaged in current affairs, politically literate person, to or at least just to list the stages of a bill, 
overwhelmingly, I think they'd be unable to do that. And that means that you have a problem. Because basically, when you don't know what's going on, you don't know where the problems are, you don't know how to fix it. You get this generalized, this kind of malaise of anger and frustration at politics without any of the kind of specificity that allows you to be, you know, pro to properly understand why it's taking place. Secondarily, it's, um, I mean, lots of the time it's the MPs themselves. If you sit down with a lot of MPs and go, look, this is what you need to do to start praying against a negative statutory instrument for the world, most of them will just sort of have no idea what it is that you're talking about. You know, there's, <laughs> and I think that that's part of a system of control. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's no incentive for them to learn it. There's very little put on by the parties to try to equip them to scrutinize legislation when they enter the Commons, because why would you want them able to do it in the first place? It, if you don't know how things operate, it's much easier for someone to tell you, well, you have to do it this way. And the person that's going to tell you that is going to be the whip's office. You know, and even when you do understand the rules, you start putting them together. The standing orders, uh, uh, rulings from the chair, uh, me. I mean, most of this stuff, no one could, pro I mean, there might, there's probably like three people in the world who would actually have an encyclopedic knowledge of the whole thing. And even then, they're quite malleable and changeable. They seem much stronger than they are, but actually when it comes down to it, Oh, look, John Burko has decided that now actually you can have more than two amendments on a Queen's speech. So that isn't actually a thing anymore. You know, they're not even proper rules as we understand them. So it adds up to an incredibly opaque system, which is always consistently to the benefit of the political party HQ and to the detriment of MPs. Yeah, no, I can completely see that. Um... So I used to work for the Local Government Boundary Commission and we used to put down statutory instruments. That's how we changed local government boundaries. And they were negative resolution ones, which meant that you had to pray against them, which means that yeah. I feel, you know, brilliant that I understood what you said there, but they're really just, you know, and I think, you know, and this is, this is the sort of thing where, you know, and the Member of Parliament, I think they put down an early day motion in order to pray against it. You know, that was like one of the standard things they do, which sounds absolutely ridiculous, so much so that I'm now doubting myself. And so, you know, these are this is the sort of system where there are so many moving parts that it's, you know, that it's really difficult to grasp hold of. Now, multiple people in the chat have talked about how we can get people involved in politics. I'm pretty certain that none of the people in the chat, and certainly if I'm asking the question, then I don't mean, can we have a politics GCSE in which we learn the stages of the bill and we recite Erskine May? You know, we don't want to do that. But how can we get people actually feeling like they're engaged in politics, you know, feeling like they're part of politics? You know, how can we get, get the average person to be to want to engage with political discussions rather than feeling like they have to sit there and go, yes, I know what a, you know, what a negative resolution, you know, statutory instrument is. Well, I think, I, see, that's funny, right? Because I, I used to worry about that kind of thing as well. Uh, but I, I kind of don't anymore. And I, it, it, since 2016, I feel like there's been a lot of engagement, like a lot of, you know, really not all of it great. I haven't really necessarily enjoyed this political engagement, but it's been, there's been engagement, you know, in a real sense that people care. I mean, if you sit in a pub and you hear people, you know, if they're talking about, you know, someone they know that fell over in the driveway and had a heart attack and it took, you know, how many hours for the ambulance together, they are having a political discussion. It might not necessarily always sound like it, right, but they're having a political discussion and they're, Anger over that is also political and can have political consequences. So I think when, when I get asked it, so pe lots of the time people ask me sort of like, how can you make the change? And I'm not good at that because I'm just a sort of, you know, crybaby person that whinges on Twitter. You're the person life. pointing out the problems, you know, and you need Maybe. somebody like that. You know, there are those various exercises you do and there's one where somebody has to wear the black hat and point out the problems, which is absolutely fine. You know, you need that person in the team. Yeah, I mean, th that description, I, I don't love that. And it makes me sound like someone who's not going to be very popular whenever I go to some social occasion. It's like, oh, here's Ian. He's the guy that points out all the problems with everything and doesn't have anything useful to say. Um, so, I mean, I, with most of this stuff, you sort of think, look, in some cases, join a political party if you feel that there's one along, you know, that really suits you. In others, it's, you know, joining pressure groups. Pressure groups make change. Also, by the way, I mean, I have to say, like the, the bit that we probably don't talk about very much is also the way that think tanks 
inform policy in a really sustained way that I think is underanalyzed, actually. Um, and the same, I mean, if you were to see, you know, the, the man that just got released after being, um, uh, for the miscarriage of justice, he spent 17 years in jail for rape. That was a result of appeal of a group that campaigns on cases like this, which is trying to get the forensics. And that change will probably lead to policy change, that story, on the basis of how people are treated when they suffer a miscarriage of justice, what kind of attention should be pointed to it. Often, my answer to it for people individuals is usually like, find the thing that you really, really care about and dive into that. You can have the, the further political, sort of party political stuff if you want, but also a really good way of doing this is to find the stuff that you care about and get involved. So I think then maybe I need to rephrase the question, um, which is how do we get people engaged in a more positive way rather than just being angry? You know, because I see that there's a lot of anger at the system. I see that there are a lot of people who are looking at things and going, yeah, actually, I'm furious at that. You know, they said, yes, it is true that, you know, that it's a, you know, that if you're having a discussion about, you know, waiting times at the NHS or whatever, that that, you know, that that means that you're having a passionate discussion. But people don't, people don't feel that they have any power and they don't necessarily know how they can get involved. How do we, how do we engage people positively? Maybe I should be answering that and I'm not sure what it is either. So, I mean, to me that this starts and has done since Brexit was that slap in the face. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use the word liberal here and I kind of assume that that would be a word that many people watching this would associate with. If you don't, I get it, but you know. Generally speaking, people that are concerned with rational, evidence-based assessments of politics mm -hmm. that truly take into account what a problem is and want to try and fix it. Um, most of the time over the last few years, we've seen anger at politics be channeled by populists of various kinds, whether they're in newspapers, whether they're in parliament, whether they're presidents, basically turning it into a very simple narrative. And that's emotionally effective. It has proved powerfully effective they're storytellers, they tell emotional stories and it works. And one of the things that I am frustrated by how slow liberals are to learn from 2016 and what's come afterwards is the ability to talk in a similar kind of way, but about a world that is actually empirically sound and rational and actually addresses problems as they stand. To talk with their heart as well as their head, to tell stories, to talk to people in the kind of language that people actually use, rather than the kind of crass, distant, passive managerialism that seems to have completely overcome the political class. So that when they start talking, you just think that there's some faulty robot that's been allowed onto the TV, rather than an actual flesh and blood, fully functioning human being. So in that, the manner in which you speak, the clarity with which you speak, the passion, the conviction, these are things that I feel liberals have really let slide have really not learned how to do and they haven't even learned the lesson since 2016. So to me, the turning it from just anger to something more positive starts with having people that can talk about this stuff in normal language and with passion and commitment, but not lying to the people that they're speaking to. One of the things I find is a real problem, um, you know, particularly if I'm thinking about this. Um, so I find myself, you know, I think I'm fairly good at getting the message out of something. But if you've got something like democracy, then it's quite nebulous, it's nuanced, it's difficult, you know, and it's actually quite difficult to find a really coherent message that you don't have to explain several layers of it. You know, something like uh, climate change that feels very clear, coherent, it's a very simple message, it's a strong message. But I find that democracy can be much more uh, much more difficult to explain in a few simple words mm. so can i do a, a slight apology to people in the q a my computer has done a thing i'm not quite sure what thing exactly it is but it means that i can't <laughs> see all of those bits <laughs> i meant to ask more questions and i'm now realizing that i can't see half the things ah it has come back see the joys of technology. Here we are sitting in our independent sitting rooms and yet we can, you know, we can see the various questions. I'm just scrolling down here because I'm wanting to ask you about solutions, but I'm wondering if there's anything that that uh, jumps up. Ooh, before we move on to solutions, very quickly, 
what do you think about um, devolution of uh, uh, power? You know, devolving power down. To, you know, there are several people who have asked about should regional governments exist in England? Should there be an English parliament? Should we have just beefed up sort of, you know, systems? You know, and this probably brings into question some things like mayors, which we have tried and gone back and forth on several times in various parts of England. What do you think about taking power away from Westminster? Yeah, look, successful countries have thriving local power centres because it means that you can, I mean, fundamentally it means that you can experiment. You know, mm -hmm. but let's say one area decides, well, we're going to um, legalise cannabis and you don't need to do it to the whole country at once. You can just have a local area, try it as we've seen in the US, many other countries. And people see if it works, other other bits of the state will follow, and if it doesn't, people tend to stay away. And it makes you a much more dynamic country when you're not in this straitjacket of sort of every change has to apply everywhere. And a lot of that would point towards handing greater powers to local councils, even though local councils are in a complete state. And you really need a thriving local media to hold them to account, something which at the moment we do not have. My problem when we get to the more sort of federalist um, sort of conversations is just the complexity of the basic fact that England is too big. You know, and once you start looking at the relationship with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, it's fine, you know, we cannot just have these four units, or maybe we can, but we need to be honest about how weird that is. If you can be outvoted, the millions and millions of people in, that live in England compared to the comparatively fewer millions that live in Wales and Scotland. I mean, the population of Scotland is sort of around the same level as the population of London. You know, if you were to have England mm -hmm. being persistently outvoted by blah, 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 that just doesn't feel right. And yet, then if you try to break England into different sort of units, that starts raising questions as to how. We tried that thought. before, and you know, you know, something like 20 years ago, we had a vote for regional yeah, yeah. government in the Northeast, and that fell flat on its face. And I theoretically voted in that. I just can't remember which way I voted, to be absolutely honest. <laughs> it was a long time ago. It did. I mean, look, I. It's, it's complicated and I think it's hard. And, and so that whole issue quickly gets lost in that fundamental problem of the size of England. Mm -hmm. a, a much easier way of solving this stuff is just start saying, what kind of powers can we hand down to local councils? Yeah. Yes. And you there again, you have quite a disparity in local for local councils, you know, particularly in England. You know, you have some large unitaries. You know, you have places like Birmingham, which have huge population, one council. Then you've got places that are, you know, you know, that are unitary, but they're much more rural and spread out. And then you've got some really, really small councils. So, again, you know, you've got mm. these differences in, you know, who you're handing the power down to. Yeah, that's entirely correct. Um, you have at the end of uh, your How Westminster Works book, you know, you've got a whole chapter about, you know, different solutions. Well, the epilogue, rather, it's not a chapter in itself. Um, you've got a number of solutions there and, you know, they all seem broadly sensible. But I mean, which of which of those solutions, you know, what are the top three that you would really want to implement them? And how likely do you think it would be that they'd actually be picked up by the next government? Let's assume that that is Labour. <laughs> uh, very unlikely. Um... If I had to do a topic, it's, it's, it must be quite obvious from what I said that number one is electoral reform. And I think the electoral system lies at the root of many of our problems. Um, I would, I think number two would have to be giving back the Commons control of its time, which seems almost esoteric, but it's just the humiliation involved in that. The idea that the government really controls the Commons, but to say that clearly, the exec there is no real division of power in this country. You know, the executive controls the legislature. But that is not a tolerable state of affairs. That goes against any kind of liberal democratic norm as established from the time of John Locke. John Locke would have looked at that and thought, well, what is it that you're doing here? You, you've, got, you've got the whole thing arse over tip. It's an absolute disaster that we have it arranged in that manner. There's no respectable legislature that would allow it. Absolutely, the Commons needs to take back control of its time. And when you look at the Lords, one of the reasons the Lords works is because they can take the time to look at something properly. They can actually give it the space of it needs, not have the government just try and stuff it through as fast as possible. 
The government would say that it needs more stuff to go through, though. You know, the government would say, actually, you know, we have things, you know, that we've been elected to do. You know, we've got to push them through. Surely we need all of the bill time. You know, yes, you know, you can have a, you know, a slot for a bill over there. And, you know, let's have a few private members bills, not too many, of course. Um, you know, but that's what the government would say that it's been elected to do. You know, how would you argue against that? So I think when, when I put that system together in the back of the book, I'd say that you'd probably get about half as many bills as you do now, right? Okay. So you're still passing, you know, in a five-year period, you'll still be passing like a hundred pieces of legislation. You know, you're going to be passing a lot of law. At the moment we have, if anything, too much law and very badly thought through law. So you have a process which is much slower, which takes its time. Like, for instance, report stage, nobody gives a shit about it. It's actually like probably the most important stage in, in the Commons Chamber. I mean, currently we give one day to report stage. Typically speaking, we give one day and a day is not a day. A day starts, you know, sort of 3 p.m. You know, it's, you're basically talking about four hours, five hours of time. Report stage, if you're running something properly, would take three days. That's the kind of time that you would need. And you can quicken it up with electronic voting, which we should have in the Commons, but you need that kind of time to do these things. The government can still pass its legislation. It will just be slower because it will be better thought through. And because it's better thought through, it actually has a chance of gaining purchase and doing something in the country. The final part of this I would add, by the way, is just you, you've got to get rid of Downing Street. You cannot have Downing Street as, as we do now. It is a joke. Like we, we put the government in a house. It doesn't make any sense. It's an absurd state of affairs. It's a 17th century townhouse. Over and over again, governments go into this place, you know, starting with, like, I mean, even before Wilson, but Wilson's administration, they were spending a lot of time going, well, this is just absurd. We can't run anything in here. This is a house. And you see the same thing. I mean, Jonathan Powell would make the same point, you know, during New Labour's time. Uh, Dominic Cummings, to his credit, to be fair, made the same points during Boris Johnson's time. It's recognised by administration after administration that you cannot run, a, you can't really run any kind of serious project there. And you look at where the policy unit is. The policy unit, the really vital part of the Downing Street structure, is currently split in three different levels. They're going to speak to each other. And so you, if you want to have something running properly, you have to have a space in which it can run properly. So you would turn Downing Street into a museum and put the government somewhere where it can actually do its bloody job. And that could be the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, fine, take it off them, they're not really doing anything with it. Or it could be the QE2 Centre, or you can build something from scratch. But it needs to have a proper functioning office space suitable for modern government, not the kind of pathological sentimentality that we've been done with here. Mm -hmm. So I feel as though we have both been perhaps more cynical than, than the audience were expecting at times. Um, thank you for listening along, Richard. Um, I mean, there is a certain amount about politics where, where you recognise so many of the flaws. You know, you end up saying, what can you do? And actually, we as campaigns need more passion coming in saying, yes, you can change this. Let's mm -hmm. change this now, rather than people sitting here and saying, well, it was like this 20 years ago, thus it's going to be, you know, like this 20 years in the future. And I think actually that is a, uh, you know, that's something which I want to reassure people out there that there are people who are passionate and not just in a furious way, you know, passionate in a let's actually make some change. So it is one minute to seven. How about a really positive note to end on? Ian? Think of something. Th th let's let's finish this on something really positive and uplifting. What can people do, or what do you suggest people do? What do you, you know? What's a good thing that we can make happen? No, I, 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 I've already sort of said. You know, you can join an organisation, you can join a party, but it's it's more than that, really. It's just that um, I sometimes suspect we have this kind of fatalism about us, particularly on sort of liberal circles, particularly in this country. But change happens all the time. A political change happens every day all around the world and it has happened previously in this country as well it happens because people agitate for it because they fight for the things that they believe in and it all starts with that it ultimately starts with an emotional decision in the heart which is that i can change things but to give them credit like you look at the brexiters they took what decades of just looking like these misfit freaks and then they actually managed to successfully sabotage, you know, our entire country. So I rather wish that their project was different, but they demonstrate to you that no matter how hopeless the project is, if you're willing to put in the graft, 
and you have the clarity of vision to pursue it, you can secure political change. And that is no less true for people on the liberal side of things than it is for those on the nativist side. That is a really good positive comment, I think. You know, just just keep on going. You know, change often happens like an avalanche. You know, there'll be one or two stones that suddenly shift the whole thing and you never yes. know which one or two stones those are going to be. You know, so if you just keep on, you know, a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, then at some point something will happen, though it feels a bit like nothing's happening, you know, right the way along until that moment. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you um, for our attendees. Uh, it has been lovely to be able to talk to Ian. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom Brake, would you like to say anything at the end, uh, um, just to you know to finish us off? Yes. Uh, well, thank you. First of all, I'd like to apologise for arriving late, but I guess it was ironic that m the reason for my lateness was talking about Nadine Doris, which I think encapsulates some of the significant problems that we have in our uh, political and democratic system when a member of parliament can choose not to perform their role, their important role representing their constituents in parliament, and there is absolutely nothing that can be done about it. Um, but uh, Ian, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the, I don't know whether Jess mentioned this at the beginning, thank you for working for Charter 88 some years ago, our predecessor organisation. It was actually Unlock Democracy rather than Charter yeah, 88. Really unlocked, really unlocked. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the timing, maybe the year was the wrong one then. But um, anyway, thank you. It's one and the same organisation, uh, really insightful and um, certainly will be perhaps developing the solutions that you set out in your book, because um, the chapter on solutions is slightly shorter than the chapter setting out the problem. So we, we need to work on uh, on those solutions. And uh, I think together uh, we, we can do that. So thank you very much, Ian. And thank you, of course, Jess, for, for chairing what's clearly been a fascinating session. And we thank hope to you see you all again soon for our next uh, webinar. Excellent.